Hello, everyone. The topic that I want to discuss today is how do we increase pleasure and joy in our observance of Torah and of mitzvahs? Because it may not come naturally. Now, there are things that pleasure does come natural, where you don't need a class, you don't need a lecture, you don't need a live stream. When it comes to eating ice cream, when it comes to eating potato chips, there's not much that you need to learn about it in order to enjoy it. But it's pretty clear that when it comes to studying Torah, when it comes to observing mitzvahs, that it requires a lot more effort. So I want to turn to this week's Torah portion to see what we can learn, what we can derive from it that will allow us to increase the level of pleasure and joy that we have in our Torah learning and in our observance of mitzvahs. So to do this, I want to share my screen with you because there's a PowerPoint that I made uh, for this a few years ago that I think will be very helpful for this class. So bear with me for a second. So the title of this class is Simple Pleasures, A Unique Outlook on Gratification. So this week's Torah portion is Vayikra, which discusses the laws of sacrifices. And what we're gonna to discuss today is not what is it that we are supposed to offer, not what we're meant to offer on the, sac on the altar, but rather what the Torah clearly prohibits us from putting on the altar. The Torah tells us that there are certain things that may not be included in, in a sacrifice, they, not meet, they may not be put on the altar, and they have, we have to avoid at all costs. What are those things? The Torah says yeast, any leavening agent leavened bread may not be on the altar, and the Torah tells us that honey and anything sweet cannot be put on the altar. Now, you can ask yourself the question, why? Especially when it comes to honey. Honey is something that is sweet, it's beautiful, it's tasty, it's delicious. You would think that when it comes to putting something on the altar, you would want to dedicate something that's sweet and holy and delicious to God. It's pleasurable, let's dedicate that pleasure to God. Yet the Torah says no. So let's look into it a little bit deeper. The Rambam gives a very simple and practical answer. The Rambam says that this was the practice of idol worshipers, that when it came to pagan religions, they only offered leavened bread, they only offered sweet items, including honey on the altar, therefore we want to make it clear that the concept of a Jewish sacrifice in no way bears any relationship to what idol worshipers do when they were offering sacrifices. Therefore, it is prohibited to have any leavening, any yeast, or anything honey on the altar. The Abarbanel has a different approach. The Abarbanel says that when it comes to using a leavening agent, it takes time for the dough to rise. Anyone who's ever baked challah, especially if you've been involved in a camp and there's a deadline that you mix dough together and you need the dough to rise, you know that it takes time and it never takes the same amount of time that it's supposed to. So the Abarbanel says, the Torah says, you're not allowed to use any leavening agent because the, the dough will have to rise and that may cause you to miss the deadline for when the sacrifice has to be brought. We don't wanna delay the sacrifice Therefore, we're not going to use any dough. The Abarbanel says it's exactly the opposite reason when it comes to honey. The Abarbanel says what happens when you put a honey on meat? It starts interacting with the meat. It starts breaking down the meat, and it can cause the meat to start rotting. Now, today with refrigeration, this is not a problem. But if we talk about the times of the temple, we're talking about a completely outdoor experience where there was no refrigeration, meat that was sitting in the sun, you start mixing it with honey and the meat is gonna to start to rot and to deteriorate, this could be a problem. So therefore you might offer the offering too early. You might do it too soon and, it's going to, and, and the, the timing is going to be off as well. The Medrash goes with a little bit of a different approach, right? The Medrash says, what is it that yeast does? It causes the dough to rise. Rising equals haughtiness, this equals ego, this equals the Eight Sahara. When it comes to approaching God in the base of Migdash, when you're going to bring a sacrifice, we cannot approach God with ego, we have to approach God with humility. Therefore, leavening agents are going to be prohibited from being part of the sacrifice, they're prohibited from being part of the altar. Similarly, the Medra says the same thing applies to honey that when you cook honey, it lets off a lot of steam. This is similar to the idea of ego. This is haughtiness. This is ultimately the Sahara. 
and the Yetzirah cannot be part of the whole experience of bringing an altar. The Chinuch, who has a beautiful commentary that explains the practical reason behind every mitzvah, tells us what is the problem with bringing a leavened bread on the altar. The symbolism of leavened bread is that it's something which takes a lot of time to rise. Now, this is exactly the opposite of the approach that we need to have when it comes to doing mitzvahs. The Torah tells us that we have to be light as an eagle, we have to be swift as a deer, we have to be energetic, we have to be moving, we have to be running, we have to do Torah mitzvahs with, with alacrity. Leavening represents laziness, and that is something that, that cannot be brought on the altar. For Torah and mitzvahs, there has to be speed. Now, what about honey? This kind of makes such an interesting comment that a honey represents sweetness. This means that a person is eating food for pleasure, not for strength, and not for energy. This represents an attitude to life where what is the number one goal? Self-gratification, self-enhancement. This, of course, is not what bringing a sacrifice has to be all about. We have to be healthy. We have to be strong. That's the message. So when it comes to bringing, an alt, bringing a sacrifice, we, wanna, we want to remove any sense of ego, any sense of selfishness, any sense of self-gratification, we want to raise to a higher level. Now, the Arizal uses a little bit of a deeper idea here. He moves to a more Kabbalistic perspective. And he says, the reason that you can't bring leavened products or honey on the altar for an offering is because Kabbalistically speaking, they represent the divine attribute of Gvura. The divine attribute of Gvura represents severity, judgment, discipline, limitation, and this is not what an offering is all about. An offering is an attempt to elicit divine kindness. The word for offering in Hebrew is the word carbon, which comes from the word kar, which means it's an opportunity to become close to God. It's not about judgment. It's not about limitation. It's not about discipline. It's not about severities. Therefore, these things need to be removed from the table. Now, but this comment itself requires further clarification because we can understand why a leavening product or a leavening agent is considered to be severities and judgment. Because with a leavening agent, it causes the bread to become sour, it causes the bread to ferment. This can re relate to severities, judgment, discipline. But what about honey? Honey is all about sweetness. It's a delight. It's about pleasure. This should be the ultimate representation of our coming closer to God with sweetness. Why should that be prohibited at all? So in order to answer this question, we need to rethink what pleasure is all about. And the place that we're going to go to do this is to think about the Mount Sinai experience when all the Jewish people were gathered together to receive the Torah from God. What do you think the atmosphere should have been at Mount Sinai? Again, all the Jewish people are coming together. God is going to personally descend on the mountain and share with us his most intimate, deepest desire, which that is to connect to us through Torah and through mitzvahs. The way that this is generally understood in Jewish tradition is that Mount Sinai was like our wedding with God. Now, what is the atmosphere at a wedding? Happiness, joy, singing, dancing. There's music. Yet what does the Torah tell us about the atmosphere that there was at Mount Sinai? There was fear and there was trembling. There was thunder, there was lightning, there was the sound of a shofar. Why would that be? You would think that there should be excitement. You would think that there should be, should, there, that there should be joy. You should think that there should be some pleasure. There should be music. Yet we find that it was quite the terrifying experience. Why would that be the case? So let's go back to think about pleasure. There are many different types of pleasures that exist. A person can experience the pure pleasure, joy of a beautiful piece of music. A person can experience pleasure and joy from a delicious piece of steak and some wonderful food. A person can also experience a much more refined pleasure, and that is from a brilliant, genius, helpful, and productive idea. Now I ask you, which of these is the essence of pleasure. Which of these represent what is the core essence idea, the truest and deepest form of pleasure? 
And the answer, of course, is none of them. Because the essence of pleasure is something that cannot be perceived. Now, what do I mean by that? Why is it that the essence of pleasure can't be perceived? But what, what is it that we do perceive as some type of external manifestation of pleasure? The best way to understand it is that pleasure is a power of the soul. Pleasure is a soul power. Perfect example for this is the capacity for the soul to see is expressed in the eyes. The capacity for the soul to hear is expressed in the ear. But even if a person does not have a functioning eye, or a person does not have a functioning ear, that doesn't mean that the soul doesn't have the capacity to see. All it means is that the external manifestation of the soul's capacity to see or to hear is limited and is not functional. But the essence of sight and the essence of hearing always exists within the soul. The same principle can, can be related to pleasure. The concept and the idea of pleasure is a soul power it exists in the essence of the soul, whether it is experiencing pleasure or not. However, it needs to experience something on an external way in order to trigger and to tap into and to draw out the ray of pleasure. But the essence of pleasure exists in the essence of the soul, whether it's currently experiencing pleasure or not. Now, here's the question. What about God? When God wants to experience pleasure, when God wants to experience delight, does God need something external to him to cause delight? For a human being to experience pleasure, we require an external trigger to awaken and to arouse and to touch the source of pleasure in our soul. What about God? The answer, of course, is no, because nothing exists outside of God. God is the reality of all existence. So there can't be something that's external to God that has to trigger within God his source of pleasure. Rather, God has the capacity and the ability to delight in himself, within himself. What does that mean? That God actually experiences the essence of delight as it exists within himself. So when it comes to the truest and deepest form of divine pleasure, it exists within God himself and is not related to and is not relative to something that is external. Now, what was Mount Sinai all about? Mount Sinai was an opportunity to connect with God in the deepest possible level. It was intimate. It was a wedding. It is the deepest possible relationship with God. God was sharing with us his inner core and his inner soul. God was allowing us to experience pleasure and delight within his essence itself. Now, how are we able to do that? The problem is, is that human beings are too limited. We are finite people while God is infinite. How is it that we could experience the infinite pleasure and delight that exists within God's soul? In order to allow for that to happen, God had to push away our own pleasure. God had to put away our preconceived notions. God has to put away our limited definition, our limited understanding of what that is to be pleasurable, because that gets in the way, our finite pleasure gets in the way of experiencing the infinite pleasure. So therefore, the atmosphere, the energy that was created at Mount Sinai was one of fear and trembling, because the fear and trembling caused us to push our own sense of pleasure aside and that opened us up to be available to experience the essential pleasure of God that God was sharing with us at the giving of the Torah. Now we can understand and appreciate how it is that a honey can be considered a severity, how honey can be considered a limitation, and why it should be prohibited from being offered at on the altar. Because honey is something that we as finite human beings experience as sweet. But based on the previous explanation, we know that it's not the true essence of sweetness. It's not the true essence of pleasure. It's an external manifestation of the divine essence of pleasure that we as finite, limited human beings can experience. That means it is a limited and contracted form of pleasure, and that is not the goal of a sacrifice. The goal of a sacrifice, the goal of coming closer to Hashem is to bond with Him, to become one with Him, to unite with Him, 
and we don't want to bring any type of limited, contracted, finite experience of pleasure into that relationship. We set aside that preconceived notion in order to bond and connect with God in the most deepest way. Therefore, honey is going to be prohibited on the altar. Human beings, by definition, are limited and finite. In order to touch the infinite, the limitations need to be removed. How do we apply this ultimately to our relationship with God and to experience true pleasure from Torah and Mitzvah? We have to recognize and appreciate that we have a preconceived notion of what it is that's pleasurable and what it is that's enjoyable. In order to experience true pleasure with God, we have to set aside all preconceived notions. We have to set aside any agenda that we may have of what it is that we want to accomplish through studying that Torah and through studying that mitzvah. When we do that, right, when we open ourselves up, we put aside our ego. We open ourselves up to experience what it is that God is communicating us through the Torah. We open ourselves up for the divine pleasure that we can experience with God by connecting with the mitzvahs, that is how we're ultimately able to experience true pleasure with God. Put yourself aside, put aside your preconceived notions of what pleasure is all about, open yourself up to a deep, real relationship with God, and you'll not just experience pleasure as a result of some type of external stimulus, but you absolutely will be able to experience the truest pleasure, the greatest pleasure, the essence of pleasure, divine pleasure, which totally transcends our previous finite experience of Torah. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. If you have any questions and comments, please leave them below or email me them. Have a wonderful, fabulous day and a joyous, divine, pleasurable week.